I'm Ray Dean. Welcome to Life Sciences. Today we're going to look at, or we're looking at the topic evolution and we're going to have a look at speciation. All right, so where did so many different species, and for example, on the Galapagos Islands, we find that there are 17, well, there are 13 confirmed and, and, and possibly another four or even more different species of finch. Um, and where did they all come from if there was only one ancestral population? All right, so let's have a look at the concepts. We're going to have a look at um, in this topic. So we have a look at speciation. We're also going to look at reproductive isolation and evolution in present times. Okay, so specifically, we're going to look at biological concepts. Um, we're going to have a look at the very important terminology because terminology is all in, is important and very uh, much so is species, the difference between species and population. And then we're going to go on and have a look at um, at geographic speciation and the mechanism that involves uh, actual new species forming. All right, so let's first have a look at the concepts. And, and here I would just like to stress that it's very important and especially when we are answering a question based on speciation, we need to know the difference between the concept of a species and a population. They are quite similar. Um, and when we and as we go through the lesson, I will show you why and where we say uh, we need to use either the word species or we're going to use the word population. And that is why it's very important to know the difference. All right, so let's have a look at the first one, and that is species. So a species is a group of organisms. So it would be whatever plants or animals. And they have similar characteristics. So, um, you know, there would be some kind of relatedness there. And they are able to interbreed. So that's important. They would be able to then produce fertile. And fertile means that those offspring will be able to produce more offspring. So in other words, um, they then can continue the species, produce more offspring. Okay, so that's very important. So it's organ, a group of organisms with similar characteristics and if they interbreed or when they interbreed, they produce fertile offspring. Right, then we have a look at the term population. And population is a group of organisms, again, so that's why I say it's difficult, uh, you know, these, they're very similar, these definitions. So that's why you really need to know them well. So it's also, again, a group of organisms. And usually these organisms are of the same species. And they are found in the same habitat at the same time. Okay, so it, we don't say anything about them interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. We just say that they are in the same habitat at the same time. They have similar characteristics. They usually are a group of organisms um, that are, are from the same species. Because remember, a species is, is massive. And a species can be spread all over uh, in very many, in very large areas, a large environment. Um, but we'll find smaller groups. And we call those populations. All right, then we're going to have a look at the term biodiversity. Um, and we said earlier is that bio is living and diversity would be variety of life. And that variety of life is what exists on Earth. So it's what we can find on Earth. And that variety includes plants, animals, fungi and microorganisms as well as the communities. Because remember, organisms don't live in isolation. They live in ecosystems, in habitats, where they actually um, interrelate. So they depend on each other for various reasons. And that is what we call biodiversity. All right, then we're going to have a look at a, a cladogram. 
Um, it's a diagram, so it's one of our evolutionary diagrams. And basically what it does is it represents hypothetical or theoretical relationships between groups of organisms and their common ancestor. So in other words, we can see how related or how um, common or how many species have a common ancestor and we look at the evolution as it occurred over time of these organisms. All right, and then the next term we're going to have a look at is extinction. And extinction um, is very important. It's a very important concept to know because this is where organisms that have been, have existed on Earth die out. So in other words, um, they no longer, it's, um, you know, once they've died out, there are no longer that species or those organisms uh, on Earth. And um, we, we know we have extinction events and we've learned about uh, mass extinctions and things like that where organisms, and a, a good example of an extinct uh, group of organisms are the dinosaurs. Okay, so they have become extinct. Right, then we're going to have a look at the term or at the concept of reproductive isolation. And that has to do with reproduction, obviously. And it's where organisms, so to prevent crossbreeding of species. So in other words, species are not able to interbreed because usually when species interbreed, they are they don't produce, because we said that is the concept of, of species, is they are able to um, produce fertile offspring. So if we have crossbreeding in species, more often than not, the, the offspring, if they are able to produce offspring, they are infertile, which doesn't mean um, that the species will continue. So this is why organisms have reproductive isolating mechanisms that can keep them separate so that they don't crossbreed. All right, so that's so that species breed successfully with related species, okay? Um, and it can be for whatever reason. So they're geographically in the same place. Um, so they, they need to have an isolated, isolating mechanism. Um, they have behavioral patterns. They have physiological. So in other words, they might have display characteristics or even genetic barriers that prevents them from interbreeding. All right, we're going to have a look at the next term, and that is as a result of um, cross um, breeding between different species. We have offspring that usually we call them hybrids because they are, come from different species, and they usually, very often, the hybrids are infertile. So it's not really a new species because remember we said the definition of a species is that um, those organisms must be able to produce fertile offspring. Okay. Okay, so that's all we have time for now. We're going to take a break. Um, try and stretch your legs, get something to drink, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back. I hope you managed to stretch your legs and get a little bit of a break. So now what we're going to do, and you're ready for the next section, is we're going to look at um, the actual process of speciation. Um, we're going to see how the mechanism takes place. And we need to learn um, to be able to describe or explain this process uh, when we answer exam questions. Okay, so let's have a look. All right, so we're going to have a look at this topic here. Um, and there we're going to look and we call it geographic um, speciation because usually there is a geographic barrier that occurs and that is why we call it geographic speciation. Okay, so let's have a look. All right, so what geographic um, a what a geographic barrier leads to is the formation of new species or the process of speciation. Okay, so now we know that in populations, and we've learned and we know this, 
that there is variation. There's a lot of variation in a population. Um, and this is caused by these various reasons. So we, we know there's variation in individuals and it's caused by sexual reproduction. Um, we saw that. And then we see also due to genetic mutations, we've seen that due to crossing over in, um, um, in meiosis, as well as random arrangement of chromosomes in meiosis. And that all gives us variation. So now, when these variations accumulate, so when we have a whole lot of variations in a population, so there's a whole lot of them that um, uh, accumulate or uh, build up. And then we find that there's a very strong possibility or a very strong likelihood that a species can change. Okay, so that they might actually then speciate. And every population has some genetic variation. Okay, and these variations increase. So the more variations, so the more we've accumulated, the more variations there are, that increases a species' chance of survival in a changing environment. All right. Right, so let's have a look at this example here of speciation. It's quite a nice diagram. Here we see a population of beetles, and this is the original population. And if we look closely at the diagram, we can see that there are some dark brown beetles, and then there's some slightly lighter ones, and then even lighter than that, and lighter, the lightest ones. So here we can see there's variation. Okay, because it's in, so there's variation in the population. And that's very important, that there's variation. Okay, now what happens is there's some kind of environmental um, change or there's a change in the environment. And if we have a look at the next diagram here, we can see that there's something specifically that happened in the environment of these beetles. And that is that there is a river that has now developed and has now split the population in two. So there's, there were floods, heavy rain possibly, and a river has developed and now the population is split into two. Okay, so now we can see. Yeah, we see the population is split into two. So we now have two groups. All right, and as time goes on, these two populations that are split by the river, they don't um, cross, they live in these, this group lives in their area, this side of the river, and that group lives on that side of the river in their area. And what happens is normal daily life. So these organisms, they feed, they breed, they, they mate, they reproduce. Um, and so what happens is whatever conditions occur on this side of the river may be different to the conditions that are occurring on this side of the river. And there you can see the, the, the group there. They, the same thing is happening there. They, their life continues. And so what we see over time happening is that mutations will occur in this group. Okay, and they are random and natural selection occurs. And on this side, different random mutations are taking place. So what we actually see happening in the two groups is that we now see that there's even more variation. So in this group, instead of only brown beetles, we now start seeing different variations of green in the population. Whereas in this population, they've remained brown, but a lot of them are a lot lighter. So again, there's been different changes. So they've changed now um, in appearance um, on either side of the river. And after a very long time, even if we had to bring these, so even if we had a, a, a drought in this area and the conditions changed again and that river dried up and these beetles could now um, mingle, they could be brought back together, we would find that there were too many changes that took place in each population separately so that they now no longer would be able to interbreed. So then we would say that they are different species. All right, 
So here's another example of um, speciation. So we've got an ancestral population. Here's the ancestral population of, of rabbits or hares. Um, and what has happened here, again, it looks like there's a river that has caused the geographic barrier. So they now are separated. So they were one population and that population was split by the river. And what happens is as time goes, goes by, so this is time, and what we see is that they split and so there would be a natural selection occurring on this side of the river uh, due to those environmental conditions, which may be different and probably are different to the conditions that are on this side of the river. So natural selection occurring in this group on that side is going to be different. So here we have, and as you can see over time, so the populations change um, and that eventually if we had to bring them back together again, so if we brought these two back together, um, this, the difference between the two are so great that they are unable to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And so we say that new species are formed. All right, so let's look at the steps. Um, okay, so geographic speciation, as we said, is, has to do with um, some kind of geographical barrier. So if you look in this diagram here, there's a single species of plant and they distribute it over a large area here um, in the in kind of in a valley. And what happens is the sea level rises and separates the two populations. So now we find the one population here and the other one there um, and they're separated by water. And their natural selection will occur on either side. They can't interbreed anymore. There's no gene flow between the two populations. And then what happens is that even if, yeah, we can see the river or the, the sea level um, has dropped again and the, the area has dried out, but the plants have now become, if you have a look at the different plants, you can see there's quite a lot of difference between the two. So that if they had to interbreed, they would not um, so they would not be able to produce fertile offspring. All right, so, so as we said, um, geographic isolation occurs when a part of a population becomes isolated from the parent population. Okay, so, and it can be, um, they can divide into two groups and even sometimes even more groups. And this usually is due to a physical barrier. So there's something physical that has separated them. It can either be due to continental drift, um, so that there's a continental drift, so that there's an ocean between them. It can be any kind of water body, a lake, um, a dam, humans could have built a dam, a river, there could have been an earthquake, um, anything like that, any natural phenomenon um, that could have separated the population. And in fact, there can even be man-made um, barriers too. All right, so, and these barriers could be as a result of, okay, so there I put them as continental drift, ocean rivers, mountains, and other natural phenomena such as earthquakes or volcanoes. Okay, so it, what is very uh, important to remember here is that um, we have uh, a physical barrier that separates the two parts of the population. Okay. All right, now the process of speciation. Okay, so that's, and this we need to, we, when we learn, when we um, study this section, we need to study uh, the process and we need to know the steps as they occur. And uh, very often in an exam, they would ask you, uh, to apply your knowledge to a specific case study. So we're going to teach you the generic and I will discuss some examples, but uh, it's important that you are able to apply your knowledge. Okay, so we have a look at the process and here we see a population is separated by a geographical barrier, as we said, and it splits into two. Now what I want to highlight here is this term here. All along I've been talking about a population and I haven't spoken about a species because remember a species is the whole group of all the organisms, particular animal. Say let's for example say 
all the lion population in the world, uh, uh, lion species in the world. Okay, we don't have, uh, but they can't, they don't all live in one place. They are broken up into smaller groups and that's what we call populations. So here, when we talk about speciation, we not need to talk about a population. We don't say a species is split because naturally a species would be split because a whole species can't live all in one place. Okay, so we talk about the term a population is separated or split by a geographical barrier and then is divided into two populations. And those two populations, because they are, are divided by a physical barrier, they are unable to mate. And so there's no gene flow between the two populations. And as soon as there's no gene flow, um, then there's, the changes are going to occur independently of each other. So the two populations now are exposed to different environmental conditions and different selective forces, because what uh, the environment is like on one side may be different to what is on the other side. So now we have a look and we see that natural selection takes place and it happens independently on, in both populations at the same time. And so the two populations become genotypically and phenotypically different from the ancestral population. So they're now no longer the same as the population they came from or even as each other. And even if we had to bring the two populations back together, as I said, sometimes the riverbed dries up and those organisms then can come back together. They would not interbreed with one another and therefore would have become two different species. And that's what we call the process of speciation. Okay, so let's quickly summarize what we've had a look at. So we said we've got one population. And that population is split into two by a geographic barrier. And now those two populations, they would then, um, natural selection would occur independently on each side of the population. So that eventually they would then become two new species. And this is how speciation occurs. <laughs>
Okay, so let's have a look um, at, at the diagram here. So this is what we call a clad, and we can either draw it um, like this, um, where the, the um, lines come off at an angle, we can draw it like that, or we can actually have it where we have um, straight lines and we show how the species then develop like that. All right, so basically on a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree, which is a little bit of a larger diagram than that, it's very clear where speciation events occurred and where species split into two. Now, in the previous um, section, we had a look at what causes the population to split into two. And now we're going to have a look at where we can see this on an evolutionary diagram. So here where we see this, here's a species and they are developing and it's, this is through time. So this is basically time here. And as we see them developing, we see that there's a group that branches off, off the, um, the main branch. And then time goes um, on some more and then we see another branch that branches off. And so time goes apart. And when we have a look at the top here, we see we now have three different species. Okay, and we can see how they developed. So they would have come from a common ancestor or a common parent group. Um, and that is now, they have now developed into ancestor. Uh, they've developed into three different species. The same here. Here we have a common ancestor. And what happened is there was some kind of environmental um, occurrence over here. And that environmental current occurrence caused them to split. And that population split into two. And there we see then they stayed two populations for a period of time. And then there was another speciation event that took place here. Once again, the environmental conditions changed and they then, then split into two species, whereas this species just continued as is. Okay, so if we have a look at the top again, we can see that we started off with one population and we now have three different species. All right, so over time, if the species remain alive, they are extant, and extant means that they're still in existence. Okay, so we can see all of these species, um, they're still uh, 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 alive here at the end, so that they've still reached, say, if this would be present time, they would still all be um, in, in existence. So that is what we, we say they are extant. Whereas if, say, for example, this species, the branch only goes up to here, um, and they don't reach the current time, then we would say they have become extinct. So they have died out. All right, if the lineage line does not reach the top of the tree, then the species became extinct. Okay. All right. Now we need to have a look at um, what effect, what effect do speciation and extinction events have on biodiversity? Okay, so let's have a look at, at all of those terms. So first of all, speciation. So when we talk about speciation, we're talking about more species developing or species being formed. So we have more species formed. Okay, for whatever reason, due to an speciation event. And then if we have a look at the term extinction, and we just said that now, if, uh, an, if a population or a species dies out, they then become extinct. So they die out. All right. So if we have a look at those two, then we can see speciation would then increase the numbers of species that we find. So that would increase... Uh, the species, whereas an extinction event would decrease 
So it has, we have fewer species then, and so that decreases the number of species. So what effect would these two have then on the biodiversity of, that we find on Earth? Okay, so speciation events, as I said, they would increase the number of species, therefore speciation increases biodiversity. So we find that there's so many more, uh, with many speciation events, we find that there would be an emergence of many species. For example, if we have a look at the Galapagos Islands um, and uh, we have a look at the finch species, uh, they started off with one common or one ancestor species, so there was one species of finch and today when we have, a, uh, when uh, investigators or scientists have um, studied the number of species on the Galapagos Islands, they see that there are now between 13 and 17 different species of finch. So, um, and this is because what happened is when they arrived or when they, you know, the, there was a speciation event. So either they were um, geographically isolated, so they, the group was split on different islands. And when they arrived in those habitats, they found that there wasn't much competition and there was lots of available food. And so they were able to um, speciate and become so many more species. All right, and then if we have a look at extinction events, all right, and extinction events are those kind of things, and we've we we speculate, and we've um, scientists have looked through the ages, and have looked at the fossil record, and have looked at um, different aspects of um, the environment, um, and and they have seen that there were. Um, times when we had mass extinctions for whatever reason. So it could have been an asteroid um, that hit the Earth and destroyed a large area, or it could have been a volcano or an earthquake or whatever, or continental drift, and that changed the environmental conditions. And then many species died out. So what we have then, so it results in the loss of some species, and therefore it causes a decrease in biodiversity. All right, so here's a nice example. Um, they are lovely trees, and um, the baobab tree is one of South Africa's um, famous trees, if you like. Uh, we have many of them. And they, they actually become very old trees. They become very large and very old. So if you have a look at the diagrams here. So here we have the, an example of the South African baobab. You can see a lot of people call it the upside down tree because um, it looks like these are all the roots at the top here um, of the tree. And these trees can actually become very old and they become the, the, um, the diameter of the of the, the stem actually becomes very large. Okay, so that's an example that we find in South Africa. Now, there's another example that we find um, in Australia, and this is what this one looks like. So you can see, um, you know, it's, it's quite different to this one, or it's quite a, a bit different, so you can see the stem is quite different, um, and the branches and the leaves make it look slightly different, although it is still quite a, a tree that you know, spreads out. So, and that's the Australian example. Then we have a look over here at the third diagram, and here we can see these are also baobab trees, but they are found in Madagascar. And they are very different to the others in that they grow extremely tall. Over here, you can see there's um, people walking there. So these trees actually become very, very, very big. Um, and they... Uh, you know, they, they, they look quite different. But however, if we have a look at the three, so if we have a look at the Madagascar baobab and we look at the South African baobab, um, we can see that there's a, a quite a bit of difference between the two. But if we have a look at the Australian one, it seems to have, um, you know, characteristics that kind of tie the two together. So if we look at the stem of the Australian one, it looks similar to the stem, you know, that smooth kind of stem of um, the Madagascan one. However, the branches and, the, and the, the way in which they branch out of the Australian one is more similar to the South African one in which it branches out. 
So we can see that they do have characteristics that are similar. So what this would um, indicate for us is that these species or the speciation has occurred due to some kind of geographical barrier. And in this case, we know all of these. South Africa is on the continent of Africa. Australia, obviously, it's its own continent. Madagascar is an island off, um, off the, African, the East African coast. So what it shows us is that um, due to a physical barrier, so the physical barrier split the ancestral population. Okay, so the physical barrier now would be the oceans that we find between the continents. And what has happened is each of these um, groups or populations in their new environment underwent natural selection in response to the specific environmental conditions that they found themselves in. And because of that, we now have three different species of baobab tree. All right, here's another example. If we have a look, um, um, and we had a look at this when we did um, biogeography, but here we can see the large birds. They are flightless birds, and we find um, them on different continents. And once again, they are um, separated by vast um, areas of ocean uh, and water bodies. So Although they look similar, they are different species, and that is because they were separated by a physical barrier, underwent natural selection uh, separately, and then have evolved or developed into new species. All right, another example of speciation due to continental drift is also um, our organ the organisms or the animals that we call anteaters or we call them pangolins or armadillos. Um, and if we have a look here, we can see, so there's the giant armadillo on, North, on the North American continent, the giant anteater on the South American continent, um, the giant pangolin we find in Africa, and then the spiny uh, anteater we found in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so if we have a look at them, we can see that they are, they look, you know, like they have similar characteristics. So if we have a look at each of them, we can see that more than likely they came from a common ancestor and that population as well. The ancestor was split into two or three or four, however many groups, by um, continental drift and they then developed into different species. Okay. So just to sum up, <clears throat> we've had a look now at the cladogram of speciation. We've had a look at the effect that speciation and extinction has on biodiversity. And then we've had a look at specific um, examples of speciation um, due to continental drift where different species were formed. Okay, so we're going to stop there for now and we're going to take a short break um, and we'll see you back afterwards. Welcome back. I hope you had a good break. Let's carry on with the lesson. Okay, so what we're going to have a look at now, we've covered speciation and the speciation events. We're now going to have a look at reproductive isolating mechanisms, um, a little bit of artificial selection, and evolution in present times. Okay, so let's have a look. Mechanisms of reproductive isolation. So basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep species from crossbreeding. <clears throat> 
All right, so we see that there are various mechanisms that, um, that organisms do have, and they prevent two species from mating with one another and making fertile hybrids even when they are not separated by a geographical barrier. So there isn't anything physically that separates them. So they live in the same environment, but they still don't crossbreed. Okay, so let's have a look at the specific. So the first one would be breeding at different times of the year. Here we see there's example of butterflies. The one breeds in this time of the year, so July to October. And this species over here breeds from May to June, uh, from March to June, um, and so they don't, the, the breeding time doesn't overlap, so neither of them would be, then be ready to crossbreed with each other. A second mechanism we look at, we call it species specific because it happens to be for a specific species, and these are courtship behaviors. So, in other words, it's when animals, and very often it's, uh, we see a lot of it in birds, is where they're looking for a mate. And if you have a look at the diagram here, this bird has a very bright red uh, pouch that is blown up quite large and is displaying and doing a little bit of wing flapping and dancing for the female. Now, if she was from another species, that would not interest her at all and that then prevents them from crossbreeding. Another form, another mechanism is where plants are adapted to different pollinators. So if we have a look at this first diagram here, the flowers are, are quite bell-shaped, they're quite wide, they're short, and there we can see a little bee going in to pollinate the flower. Whereas if we have a look at the picture on this side here, we can see the flower is a lot longer, lots longer and narrower. So in other words, it would take the bee would have to, it would hard, probably not fit into the flower. Whereas the beak of this bird is able to fit nicely into the flower. So these two flowers would not cross pollinate because they don't, they have different pollinators. So we won't have a bee going from this flower and then onto that flower and by accident cross pollinating. All right, and then if we have a look at the fourth mechanism, here we can see we've got different um, animals. We've got a horse and we have a donkey, and when we cross them, they're going to the, the offspring that are produced is a mule. And a mule becomes an infertile, it is infertile, so it's an infertile hybrid. So in other words, this mule will not be able to reproduce. So therefore, we don't have a new species forming. And then the last um, mechanism of fertilization, uh, where we talk about prevention of fertilization, and that usually is to do with... Um, uh, in, um, copulatory organs, so you can see that's a very large dog, would not be able to mate with that small dog, and also there's um, gametes that then become, or not compatible for uh, fertilization to take place. All right, then let's have a look at artificial selection, and we know that artificial selection um, is um, to satisfy human needs. So it's an intentional reproduction uh, of individuals or specific individuals in a population that have desirable. So in other words, those characteristics that we're looking for. And we find artificial selection um, when we look at domesticated animals um, that we want. So we artificially select cattle because they have lots of meat, they, pr they produce you know, they become uh, quite strong and have lots of muscle, or we have um, those that produce high amounts of milk. So we, we find that very much so in our domesticated animals, um, of cows, pigs, pigs uh, sheep, chickens. We also find it in our food crops, where we've selected plants that might be resistant to drought, so then we um, plant more of them, or they might have a high crop yield. In thoroughbred racehorses is another example. So in other words, the um, breeders would like the horses that can um, race the fastest or run the fastest, um, and they would then breed those. And then we also find it in our domesticated cats and dogs. Uh, we have different um, subspecies there, and they are bred for whichever characteristic is uh, suitable. All right, here's a diagram showing um, artificial selection and we can see how our chickens have gone from in 1957 from 900 grams um, to now what we have artificially selected very 
large chickens that make lots of meat um, and they now are 4,200 grams. Okay, however there can be a downside to artificial selection and what it does is by selecting certain characteristics we reduce the genetic variation. Also we find that when we select um, for specific characteristics we use inbreeding and what that results in is health issues. So we find that their lifespan may be decreased or for specifically in dogs we find that commonly um, an, a, a disorder called hip dysplasia. So those are the downside of artificial selection. All right then here we can see um, where dogs have been bred um, from a wolf, so that's the common ancestor, and here we see all the various breeds, including the modern wolf. So this would be an example of a cladogram where we can see um, the speciation events and the um, organisms or the species that exist today. All right. Okay, so let's have a look at evolution in present times. And what we find, and we see this in organisms that repro reproduce very rapidly, such as viruses and bacteria. And what they do is, because they reproduce so quickly, they allow scientists to study how species change in response to environmental facts. So because the pathogens evolve very quickly, um, and there's lots of natural variation amongst them, what happens is um, they then... Uh, mutations occur quite quickly and they then uh, change. So we can see that evolution is taking place. All right, so for example, there's lots of examples that we can have a look at. We know the HIV virus or the human immunodeficiency virus um, and we know that there isn't a cure because this virus is continually mutating. And currently, um, in our new normal situation, we found that the, the COVID virus or the coronavirus, it causes COVID, and the SARS-CoV-2 or novel coronavirus. And we've seen that there are variants. In South Africa, we've even seen that there are um, two variants that we have. Um, and around the world, we see that there are many more that are emerging. So that's an example of evolution in modern times. Here also we have an example of the Anopheles mosquito, which um, is resistant, becomes resistant to the poison or the pesticides um, and multi-drug resistant TB bacterium that also are resistant to uh, the drugs or the antibiotics that we use. Okay, and that's all we have time for today. Hope you enjoyed the lesson and we'll see you again next time. Thank you.